August 20, 29th, 2015. Okay, so we'll start with the homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Good morning, everybody. And good morning to all of you out there. <laughs> Okay, so today we will be taking sutta number 138 in the Majjhima Nikaya. And this is a sutta, it's an interesting sutta, because it's a, we'll see the text, it's a little bit problematic. Okay, so the sutta is called Udesa Vibhanga Sutta. Here it's translated the exposition of a summary, but Udesa Vibhanga could also be taken as, in Pali it's called the Dvanda compound, which means translated as a dual compound. It could also, that means it could also be translated a summary and an exposition. But for Vibhanga, actually, I think that was the word that Venerable Nyanamoli had used, but I think the better word is analysis, because vibhanga comes from v So one of the implications of V is division or separation, and bunjati means something like breaking up. So breaking up into divisions is like an analysis rather than an exposition. Okay, so the sutta begins when the Buddha is living in Shravasti in Jeta's Grove, and then he addresses the monks. This is what's the interesting part. He says, I shall teach you a summary and an analysis or exposition. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. So the monks say, yes, Bhante. Then the Buddha says, Okay, let's just skip over the Buddha, makes the summary, the short statement, paragraph three. Okay, then paragraph four, it says, that is what the Blessed One said. Having said this, he rose up from his seat and went into his dwelling. Yeah, so the Buddha says, I'm going to teach you an analysis, well, uh, an ex a summary and an analysis. Then he recites the summary. Then he gets up and he he's gone. So what are we going to make of this?
Okay, so, excuse me? <laughs> I see, it was the Buddha's microphone fellow. Okay, so this is the summary statement, the Udesa, the brief statement. So he says, and it's quite, you see, it's a quite high teaching. So the Buddha says that a monk should examine things in such a way that while he is examining them, his consciousness, his vijnana, is not distracted and scattered externally, nor, here we rendered this, nor stuck internally, but maybe that's a little bit too strong. Maybe I would say not settled or established internally. And by not clinging, he does not become agitated. If his consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally, nor settled or fixed or stuck internally, and if by not clinging he does not become agitated, then for him there is no origination of dukkha or suffering, of birth, aging, and death in the future. So maybe, I don't know, we could only conjecture why the Buddha should say, I'll teach you the summary and an analysis, and then speaks only the summary and then departs. And I remember, in fact, I should present this problem because I based on Venerable Analio when comparing the different versions of Sutta number, I think it was 134, no, 133. I said, based on Venerable Analio, that the Chinese version of this sutta was superior to the Pali version, because in the Chinese version, the Buddha says, I will teach you, I don't remember exactly. No, my memory is a little vague about what I said. But the point that Venerable Analio made, I think, was that the Chinese version was better because the Buddha says, I will teach you the summary and the exposition. And in the Pali version, after speaking the summary, he gets up and departs. Whereas in the Pali, in the Chinese version, he speaks both the summary and the exposition. Okay, but so I, I said that that seemed to be a puzzle and somewhat inconsistent in the Pali version. But here we meet the same thing. Actually, the, there's a Chinese parallel to this, and both the Chinese and the Pali are in agreement that the Buddha says, I'll teach the summary and the exposition. He teaches only the summary and gets up and leaves without giving the analysis. Okay, so this is the summary, and now after the Buddha goes, this is a problem that comes up every now and again when the Buddha just gives a short statement. The monks are sort of perplexed, and they say, who will expound this in detail? And then usually when they're in this dilemma, they turn to a monk called Mahakachana. Mahakachana was 
praised by the Buddha, or he was actually appointed to the position of the monk who is foremost in giving detailed expositions of short statements of the Buddha. And so when the monks are wondering who will expound this in detail, then they consider that the Venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher, he's esteemed by his fellow monks, he's able to expound the detailed meaning, and then they decide to go to him. And what's omitted here is a stock passage that comes in quite a number of suttas. Whenever the monks go to Mahakachana, or sometimes they go to Ananda and say, please explain this in detail, then Mahakachana says, oh, you're making a big mistake. You were in the presence <laughs> of the Buddha. You could have asked him the meaning. Of course, the, the passage doesn't say, but he got up and went into his dwelling. <laughs> but you were in the presence of the Buddha. You could have asked him the meaning. Why should you come to a sort of foolish, unlearned person like myself? This is just as if a man were to enter the forest seeking hardwood, and then he would cut down a big tree, but he would pass over the trunk and then just go to the, call this the twigs and the leaves and take them away, thinking this is hardwood. And so just in the same way, when you were in the presence of the Buddha, you passed over the Buddha himself, who is like the hardwood, and you come to me when I'm just like the twigs and the leaves. But the monks insist, and then Mahakachana agrees to speak. Okay, so now Mahakachana is going to explain the meaning of the Buddha's short statement. Okay, so he starts off, even though in this short statement, the Buddha spoke about how the monk who is examining, for the monk who is examining things, his consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally. But in order to make clear exactly what's meant, Mahakachana has to backtrack in a way and explain what is meant by saying that somebody's consciousness is distracted and scattered externally. Okay, the note just says that this consciousness is distracted externally when it occurs by way of attachment towards an external object. But let's see the, the exact wording of the text. Okay, so it says, here, and it's speaking with reference to a monk, because this is part of the training of a monk. So it says, when a monk has seen a form with the eye, if his consciousness follows after the sign of form is his, if his consciousness is tied and shackled by, gratif <clears throat> by gratification in the sign of form, is fettered by the fetter of gratification in the sign of form, then his consciousness is said to be distracted and scattered externally. Let me use the Pali words here.
Okay, what's well, interesting, first, usually in passages like this, the text will speak about the citta, but here it uses a word vinyanang, which is translated consciousness. <clears throat> they both have pretty much the same meaning, but usually when the Buddha is speaking about training oneself, he refers to the citta as the object of training rather than vinyana. Here, the word vinyana is used. I don't read any great significance into this. It's probably just called this elegant, eloquent variation. Okay, then we have the word vikitang. I explained before that the, well, you saw it, the prefix v sometimes has the sense of separated. And kitang means thrown. So this is being thrown, you could say, in different directions. And there's a noun related to this, vikapa, which is what we translate distraction. So this is generally, I mean, the problem that we meet with in everyday life as well as in meditation. When one sits down to meditate, then the mind, what comes into the mind, are memories of forms, experiences, other people, and the mind, we're trying to focus on a single object to make the mind a kagata, one-pointed, unified, but the mind is vikitang, thrown in different directions or distracted. Then visatang, again it's the prefix v, separate, and the past participle satang, it's based on the verb sarati, which means to go. So this is gone in different directions. Satang, Sanskrit sritang. It's related to we have nisa, uh, sarana, budang saranangachami. I go for refuge. I think I think sarana is based on the same verb. Okay, so satang is to run or to go, and to go in different directions. So the mind or in this case, consciousness, is scattered. So it's distracted and scattered. It's thrown in different directions. It runs in different directions. And what is it thrown towards? What does it run towards? Here, when a monk has seen a form with his conscious, with, his, with the eye, <clears throat> if his consciousness follows after the sign of forms, is tied and shackled by gratification in the sign of forms. And then the sub-commentary, I have the note on this, says that the form itself is called the sign of forms in that it is the cause for the arising of defilements. I'm not so sure that I agree completely with this in saying that the form itself is the sign of form, but rather what I take to be the meaning, this is the expression rupa nimitta. So rupa is the form, nimitta is a sign or a mark, but I take this rather to be that the nimitta is you could say the significance that one ascribes to the form, or the way one sort of superimposes upon the bare sense object a certain significance, certain certain meaning, certain projections, things that one projects upon the bare sense object. So then the bare sense object comes to mean something more than just the object in itself, 
but it takes on a kind of aroma of subjectivity. In other words, there's some kind of projection of one's own interests, concerns, worries, attachments onto the form, so that the form ceases to be just a visible form, but it becomes a form with a certain meaning or significance that provokes an attachment to it. So the consciousness follows after the sign of forms. Okay, so like an example, this comes in the explanation of sense restraint. So the monk sees a form with the eye, and the example that's always given is seeing <laughs> the form of a woman. Okay, so if one has sense restraint, it doesn't mean that one just closes the eyes or puts blinders on, but when one sees the form of the woman, then one just stays with the form. It's just the form. But if one nimita gahi, one grasps upon the sign or the mark, that means one starts projecting onto it some kind of what I call subjective significance. Ah, that's a beautiful woman. Oh, what lovely hair. What a bright smile. What a nice figure. And then from that, a kind of interest starts to arise. And then from the interest, there comes desire or lust. And then the mind gets overwhelmed by passion. So this is, that would be a case of following after the sign of forms. But if one doesn't follow after the sign of forms, it doesn't mean that one stops seeing altogether, stops hearing, but one doesn't project that kind of significance onto forms, sounds, other flavors. Uh, if, for example, one is eating food, ah, today I want Punjabi food. Today I want Sichuan food. Today I want Turkish delight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, today I want some Sri Lankan curries. <laughs> and so one keeps on sort of getting attached to tastes. Okay, so if the consciousness follows after the sign of form, and then we have is tied and shackled. To the sign, the sign, to gratification in the sign of forms. Yeah, this is another important word, asad. Asada, that's what's rendered here as gratification. The original meaning. Excuse me? Too low? I'm standing in front. <laughs> okay. Okay, asada is what's translated as gratification. The original meaning is something like sweet taste, but it doesn't apply only, it's not referring only to foods. It's the sweet taste, the enjoyment that can come through any sense modality. And often the word asada comes in a set of three terms. We've gone through this quite a few times. Asada is the enjoyment, then that is followed by the adinava, which is the danger or the deficiency in the object. And then there is the nisarana, the escape or release from the object. That is the um, removal of desire and lust. Okay, but here the text only uses the word asada. 
the gratification, the enjoyment, the sweet taste or sweet flavor of form, sounds, the other sense objects. So we could say almost that there's a sequence here that first the consciousness follows after the sign of forms, like it describes a certain significant, what I call a significance, a subjective significance to the forms. It projects its own interest and desires out onto the form. Then that form acquires a significance, and then one starts to enjoy the form, and with that enjoyment, then the consciousness becomes tied and then shackled or to the sign of forms. And then the text says that it is fettered by the fetter of gratification in the sign of forms. And here the word used, it's the familiar word for fetter, sanyojana. You know, often the texts speak about the ten sangyojanas, the ten fetters that have to be broken in order to achieve liberation. But here the word is using sangyojana in relation to the gratification in the sign of the sense objects. Okay, so this pattern is sort of unfolded or unpacked in relation to each of the six sense modalities. Sounds through the ear, odors through the nose, flavors through the tongue, tactile objects with the bodily touch, and purely mental objects with the mind. Okay, so that is how the consciousness is distracted and scattered externally. And then, now with paragraph 11, now Mahakachana comes to the actual word of the sutta itself, which is how consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally. And so it says that here, when a monk has seen a form with the eye, if his consciousness does not follow after the sign of form, is not tied and shackled by gratification in the sign of form, is not fettered by the fetter of, gratif by the fetter of gratification in the sign of form, then his consciousness is said to be not distracted and scattered externally. And then this is, again, it's elaborated in regard to the other five sense modalities. So now I'll ask any questions so far on what's covered, or any questions on what has been covered so far. The Nimitta is um, based on perception, right? That's why it's always different for everyone, because obviously everyone's perception of an object. Of is course, in order for there to be an emitter, there has to be perception. Um, and you said in the Chinese suttas, they stated that the Buddha explained the sutta in, in addition to giving the summary? Not in this one. But in the Chinese version? No, n not in the Chinese ver In the Chinese version of this one, it's the same as in the Pali version. What I said is in an earlier, another sutta, the Buddha says, I will, in the Pali version, I will give a summary and an exposition. Then he recites the summary, then gets up and leaves. Then 
In the Chinese version, the Buddha spoke both the summary and the exposition. And then Venerable Analio in his paper said that this shows that the Chinese version is superior because the Buddha here remains faithful to his original statement. And then I th when I was teaching the class, I said, ah, this is a good finding by Venerable Analio. But now we come to this sutta where both the Pali version and the Chinese, in both the Pali version and the Chinese version, the Buddha says, I will teach you a summary and an exposition. And he recites only the summary and then gets up and leaves after, without giving the exposition. But then in the Chinese versions where the Buddha actually gave the exposition, yeah. Maha Kachana doesn't give an exposition. I have to refresh my memory. <laughs> Was it time for coconut water? That's why the Buddha got it. <laughs> yeah, maybe somebody came and said, Pante, the coconut water is ready. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so let us continue. Okay, so this takes care of the first part of the Buddha's statement. He's saying that he says the consciousness, one should examine things in such a way that the consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally. And then he says, nor stuck internally. Okay, so now Mahagachana is going to, it picks up on the phrase, not stuck or not settled internally. We're in paragraph 12 now. And first he begins with the negative case, the case where somebody's mind is stuck internally. And here he says, and how, friends, is the mind called stuck internally? And here he uses the word, actually, rather than Whereas the Buddha in the exposition was still using the word vijnana, as though vijnana is stuck internally. But when Mahakachana is explaining, he uses the word citta, chitang. And he says, How is the chitang santanti vuchiti? How is the citta? settled or stuck internally. Actually, often the Buddha praises having the mind chitang santitang. Like that is the stage of progress in other suttas when the mind has been disturbed by distracting thoughts. Then when one dispels and gets rid of those distracting thoughts, when the mind starts to settle in on its object, then the Buddha says that chitang santitang hoti that the mind is now calmed down, settled down. It's become still and quiet and focused and unified. But here the word santitang is being used somewhat in a negative sense. So he says, how is the mind stuck internally or settled internally. And he expounds this by way of the jhanas. So first he gives the formula for the first jhana, that the mind is secluded from sensual pleasures, um, secluded from unwholesome mental states. The monk enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is a, accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. 
So all of this is something positive and desirable, something to be praised, something to be aspired for, to be practiced for. Okay, but here's where the problem arises. If his consciousness follows after the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, is tied and shackled by gratification in the rapture and pleasure of seclusion, then his mind is said to be stuck internally. Actually, here there's a shift in wording from vijnana to citta, but it's not significant. It's just two different words with the same significance. Okay, but here the, what's being described is the situation where the mind becomes attached to this rapture and pleasure of the jhana. And so it becomes tied and shackled to that gratification in the rapture and pleasure of the jhana. So instead of using the jhana as a basis for progressing to insight and becoming detached even from the jhana, instead one takes the light in that jhana and becomes attached to it. Is that a squirrel that's come into the classroom? A dog. Your dog. <laughs> okay, it's good that he listens to the Dharma. There's a story that comes in the commentaries. Back in the time of a previous Buddha, a monk was reciting the Abhidharma in a cave and there were 500 bats in the cave. <laughs> and they heard the Abhidhamma. <laughs> and as a result of that, they became, in the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, they became the 500 pupils of Sariputta who specialized <laughs> in the Abhidharma. <laughs> so maybe this dog is going to become, in a future, under a future Buddha, a specialist in the Majjhima Nikaya. <laughs> okay, so this passage about the mind becoming tied and shackled by gratification, the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, this makes an interesting contrast with Sutta number 30, 137, the one that we just took last week, where the Buddha speaks about, let me find this, yeah, that would be page 1070, passage, so paragraph number 16, the Buddha says, by depending and relying on the six kinds of joy based on renunciation, abandon and surmount the six kinds of joy based on the household life. So in other words, one can use the joy of the jhana or the pleasure and rapture accompanying the jhana. Initially, one should sort of enjoy that pleasure and happiness, that pleasure and rapture, because that becomes the way of discarding or overcoming the attachment, the interest in the joy pertaining to the worldly life. And so through the joy of the deeper meditative states, initially, I would say, don't become detached from it too quickly, but relish it, enjoy it, and use it as a means for overcoming the interest in, the attachment to, the joy or the enjoyments of the worldly life. But if one's mind follows after that rapture and pleasure and then becomes tied and shackled to it, 
then it becomes a form of bondage. It's a higher kind of bondage than sensual desire, but this is the becomes the fetter that ties one to the form realm, to the rupa dhatu, the realm of pure form. And so when one is tied and shackled to the enjoyment of the first jhana, then one is creating the karma that will lead to rebirth in the lowest level of the form realm. This is the realm of the Brahma divinities. And so one can, you know, develop and attain that jhana and take rebirth in the form realm. But if one has the right view and understanding of the Dharma, then one can use even that rebirth to gain liberation. But somebody, people, meditators become attached to the bliss and rapture of the jhana and then forget everything else, forget to go further, and then they become just tied to, in the human realm, tied to the experience of the jhana, and then when they get into the are reborn in the divine realm, then they just remain trapped in that realm and can't break out of it. Okay, so then the same pattern is applied to each of the higher jhanas going up till we get to paragraph 15. We'll just take this because it's a little different. So with the abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a monk dwells in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and has purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. Okay, if his consciousness follows after that neither pain nor pleasure, this is the neutral feeling. It's a very, very pure neutral feeling, a feeling which is neither pleasant nor painful, but it's very, very peaceful, very tranquil feeling. And so the mind can also become shackled to that very peaceful, quiet, still, equanimous feeling of the fourth jhana. So then one becomes tied and shackled by gratification in that feeling, fettered by the fetter of gratification in that neither painful nor pleasant feeling. Then the mind is said to be settled or fixed internally. So if one becomes attached to that p very peaceful feeling of the fourth jhana, that is creating the karma which is leading to rebirth in the fourth level, the highest level of the form realm. And again, one can, if one has the right view of insight, one could let the mind be reborn there and use that insight in order to gain liberation in the form realm. But there's a danger that one will become sort of sucked into that neutral, that peaceful feeling and intoxicated with it and deeply attached to it. And in that case, one forgets the insight of impermanence, dukkha, non-self, and then becomes sort of fixed upon that peaceful feeling and trapped in the form realm. Okay, so and then we come to the counterpoint passage, how the mind is said to be not stuck internally, not settled internally. Again, one attains the first jhana, but in this case, the consciousness does not follow after the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, is not tied and shackled, by gratification in that rapture and pleasure, is not fettered by the not fettered by the fetter of gratification in the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. In this way, his mind is said to be 
not stuck internally. Okay, so in this case and in the following, according to the following paragraphs, one attains the jhana and one experiences that pleasure and joy in the first jhana, the second, and also in the second jhana, in the third jhana, just the pleasure without the rapture. In the fourth jhana, one experiences that peaceful feeling accompanied by mindfulness and equanimity. But in each case, there is not the attachment and identification with that feeling. And the, so the mind is not fettered to that feeling, not shackled to it. But one is able to enter into that state. And because one understands that even this experience of the jhana is something conditioned, composite, dependently arisen, so it's impermanent, unsatisfactory, not self. And in that way, one doesn't become fettered to the experience of the jhana. Okay, any questions now at this point? Uh, Edwin, please take the microphone. Um, would it be correct to say that when you practice in the first jhana, of course, you don't, there's gratification, there's underneath that, or whatever the case may be, there's form, or actually uh, mental formation. But now, can you actually, when you practice in an attachment, you're actually practicing insight or vipassana because you're actually looking at it as impermanent. So isn't that more going into like vipassana I at see. the same time? Okay. Yeah. When I say that one understands that the jhana is impermanent, unsatisfactory, not self, I don't think at that point one necessarily has to be actually engaged in the inside contemplation of the jhana. But what I'm just saying is that one has this understanding, this view of the jhana as being impermanent and conditioned, impermanent and so on. And so just on the basis of that understanding, one doesn't become fettered to it. So, so but of course, if one goes further, and then based on that understanding, then one can practice insight on the jhana. Right. Yeah, would it be correct to say, even if you're on the first, second, or third, before you get to the fourth jhana, would it be correct to say that you could still go further, of course, than insight meditation or vipassana? Would it be correct to say you could do it from any of the jhanas? Oh, one could do it with any oh, of, of course, the jhanas, right? yeah. yeah. Okay. Any any other question? There's somebody way in the back. Good morning. Um, can you explain a little bit more about how to practice jhana, the jhanas or meditation in general without being attached to it? Because um, the reason why I ask this question is, I mean, if you're, like in, in my personal experience, if you're trying to pursue something, sometimes it's very easy to get attached to it. Like, if I want to eat this food, if I'm always picking things, is this gonna, I don't know when to differentiate between, like, this is my, like, craving, yeah. or, like, this is just good for me. Whereas if you're a monk, everything's just given to you, so it's, I can see yeah. why. Yeah. I didn't quite get the last part of the question. Well, um, like, well, if you're a monk, then, Things are given to you, so you just have to accept yeah. them. But if you're a lay person, you're always like going after these things. So I wonder if there's a similarity between that and going after the jhanas in meditation. It's a rather complex question. <laughs> what I would say is that certainly, you know, to make spiritual progress, then it's good to practice for, with the aim of reaching the jhanas.
And initially, I'd say one doesn't have to be too concerned about becoming attached to the jhanas, <laughs> because it's a difficult enough, you know, to make the effort to reach the jhana. <laughs> so one sort of has to direct the mind fully to that, and then once the bliss and joy of the jhana, or even the lower stages of meditation arise, again I say, don't be worried that one is enjoying that pleasure and bliss because this is a way of suffusing the mind with a higher type of pleasure that helps one to turn away from coarser, grosser types of pleasure, the pleasures of the senses. It's pretty much at a more advanced level that one then, after one becomes very familiarized with the pleasure and bliss of these higher states of meditation, that one sees that the attachment is setting into it, and then one has to use some means of either reflective contemplation or direct insight to remove that attachment. But initially, if we follow the pattern of Sutta number 137, one uses the pleasure or the joy of renunciation in order to overcome attachment to the joy of the pleasures of the worldly life, then based on the joy or pleasure of renunciation, when based on that, then one gives that up in order to reach the what's called the equanimity based on the spiritual life or on detachment. Thank you. Yeah, and in day-to-day -day life, of course, it's just natural to choose certain foods over others, certain... I mean, when it's faced with many choices, one can't just be completely <laughs> indifferent to them. And I've complained. <laughs> I've mentioned, I think, in the past, when I was in Sri Lanka, getting Sri Lankan food every day, then I would think, oh, if only I could have... <laughs> a Chinese meal, <laughs> a meal of Chinese food. <laughs> now that I'm getting Chinese food every day, if somebody says, why don't we go out to an Indian restaurant? Wow, let's go. <laughs> yeah, um, Stacy. Yes, it sounds like you're saying that um, you can't get into the jhanas without becoming somewhat attached. I didn't say that one can't get into the jhana without becoming attached. What I said is that, you know, there's a tendency when that joy and rapture, pleasure and rapture arise, because it's such an extraordinarily blissful feeling, that the mind tends to become attached. I didn't say anything about pos what's possible or impossible. And and also, um, what you have to is, speak a little more. So. What is what is the um the the exact moment of going from being in the jhana into insight? Like, can you describe what that looks like? There, are, first of all, maybe I'll pass that question up because it's not really directly related to the sutta, and I want to move on into the next portion of the sutta. I want to finish this today. Okay, now we come to the portion which is interesting and problematic. I don't know if you've read the note here. Because the text, the actual Pali text that's come down, see, I modified the translation based, let me put it this way. No, I'm sorry. This is quite normal and natural. This is to be expected. It's the next passage that I modified. Okay, so how is there agitation due to clinging? Let me write these words on the board.
Okay, the word upada, this is a shortened form of the gerund or absolutive. You know what those words mean? Okay, it means have, it's the form of having done something. So upada is a shortened form of upadaya, which is having clung. There is paritasana. The word paritasana is an interesting word in that it can be based on two different Sanskrit words or Sanskrit roots. Either trish or tas. But you see, in Pali, there's no, we don't have this, these letters, the r and the sh of the Sanskrit. So in Pali, this root would also come out to be tas. The root trash means to crave. It's actually related to the English word thirst, to have a thirst for something. You could see thirst and trish. And from this word trish, from this root, we get in Pali the word tanha, which means craving. And it's hard to see in the Pali, the relation between Trish and Tanha, we can see it more clearly in the Sanskrit. Trishna, you can see direct connection. But in Pali, there's another way of writing the same word, Tanha, where you could see the connection, Tasina. I think it's spelled like this. Okay, now the word tus, the other root tus, gives a verb tusity, which means to fear, to be afraid. So the word paritasana in Pali somehow merges these two meanings of craving and fear. But in English, we don't have a convenient word that merges the meaning of both craving and fear. So, I used agitation. I don't remember exactly the word that Nyana Moli used, I think he might have used ang anguish, which I thought was not satisfactory. Trepidation? Well, trepidation is related to fear, not so much to craving. Anyway, this is the sense, but here you'll see, as this passage develops, you'll see that it's relating paritasana more to fear than to craving. Oh, that's interesting. That's true. Yeah. Okay, so let's see how the passage develops. Okay, how is there agitation or paritasana due to clinging? Okay, so first the Buddha uses the stock formula for the ordinary or the worldly person, the in Pali, the putujana, the common person, one who has no regard for the noble ones, is unskilled and undisciplined in their teaching, and so on. So this one regards, he adopts any of the 20 types of personality view, identity view, 
the view of self in relation to the five aggregates. So he regards material form as self, self as possessed of material form, material form as in the self, or self as in material form. So we have four possibilities here, positing a self in some way in relation to the body material form. Either one takes the body to be the self, or one assumes that there is a self that owns the body, so the body is mine, or else on a more philosophical level one posits that there is the self somewhere inside the body, or that there is an all-encompassing self, so that the body is within the self. In any case, one's identity Whatever view one adopts, one's identity, one's sense of personal identity is bound up with material form, with the body. So what happens? The text says that material form of his, of the worldly person, changes and becomes otherwise. This is generally referring to the aging process. With the change and becoming otherwise of that material form, his consciousness is preoccupied with the change of material form. Uh, my hair is turning gray. Oh, I look in the mirror. Those wrinkles weren't there before. Oh, what's going on? Now I'm getting weaker. Oh. In the past, I used to be able to run three miles. Now I'm getting tired, even after the first mile. Richard, do you? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Okay, but that's jumping the gun. I didn't. I want to go through the intervening phrases. Okay. So. First, let's see, we have the consciousness is preoccupied with the change of material form. Okay, so now, you know, the body is changing, maybe not necessarily just aging, but when it's getting ill. Okay, I go to the doctor, he reports, okay, you have pre-diabetes, signs of pre-diabetes, or your blood pressure too high. Or your, what is the other thing? Blood pressure is too high. Cholesterol level is too high. Yeah, you know, these it's not a laughing matter. And then, of course, what everybody fears most. Okay, well, we've done a, scre a scanning or a screening, and there's, it looks like there's a little tumor there. We have to do a biopsy. So then the mind is really preoccupied with the change in form. Okay. So then agitated mental states born of preoccupation with the change of material form arise together. It's a rather complex expression in the Pali. I won't go into it in detail here. But there's indicating like a, maybe a whole bundle of mental states can arise associated with that agitation. So this would include the panic attacks. So 
So agitated mental states born of preoccupation with the change of form arise together and remain obsessing his mind. Because his mind is obsessed, he becomes anxious, distressed, and concerned. Well, as Richard said, it can go beyond just concern, but, well, really, anxiety. Let's see what the Pali words used here. Yeah, uta, utasava. It's again, it's related to that verb tasati, to be afraid. So that's translated anxiety. Vigata is like distress, um, affliction of the mind. Kun, I think this is a Chinese kunao. And then opekava, that is. It's translated concern, a kind of attached, looking at the situation with attachment. Okay, and so in that way, upadhaya paritasati, because of clinging, through clinging, one becomes agitated. Okay, then the same pattern is explained unfolded or unpacked in regard to the other four aggregates. Okay, now we come to paragraph 21. This is the one that is a bit perplexing because the original Pali text says, Anupada paritasana, which would mean that through non-clinging <laughs> there is agitation. But that is sort of exactly the opposite of what the Buddha repeatedly teaches. You know, through clinging there is agitation, craving, fear, distress. Then get rid of clinging and then there's no agitation anxiety, distress. But if we look at this text, what it's saying, anupada paritasana, through non-clinging, there is agitation. So what to do about this? When I was working, I, th I think Venable Nyanamoli had originally translated following the Pali text, but I thought this is contradictory to the teaching there must be, it must have been a transmission error or a copious error because there's another sutta that occurs in the Sangyutta Nikaya. I think it's chapter 22. It could be sutta number seven and eight, which is exactly the same as this portion. And it has the expected reading. Through clinging, there is agitation. Through non-clinging, there is no agitation. The Sangyutta Nikaya version has anupada naparitasana, with non-clinging, no agitation. But the Pali version has anupada paritasana, through non-clinging, there is agitation. Wait, wait, let me... I had checked the commentary when working on this, and the commentary accepts the reading that's come down, and it gives a rather, what I call a convoluted explanation. It says, what is meant, I, have, I copied it here. So it says, how is there agitation through non-clinging? Then it gives the answer, through the absence of anything to cling to. For if there were anything, any conditioned thing which was permanent, stable, or the self, then it would be proper to cling to it. But because there is nothing that can be clung to, therefore, 
putting it short. Therefore, because there is nothing that be, can be clung to, there is agitation. But that, I have to say, doesn't make sense to me. Then, I mean, just yesterday and today, I checked the Chinese version of this, and strangely, the Chinese version reads exactly like the Pali version. It has the same thing. It has... Yun he bi shu ne shou er kong bu. Is that correct? Correct pronunciation? You understand? Makes sense? <laughs> you're, you're a Cantonese speaker, I want to go away. Yun he bi shu ne shou er. Kongbu. Kongbu is fear. Excuse me? Yeah. What did I say? I said no. Oh, I'm putting in a poly word there. <laughs> no wonder. <laughs> this is what happens to me sometimes when, <laughs> when I meet a person from Sri Lanka and they start to speak to me in singular. Then I start to re try to reply to them in singular, but suddenly I realize I'm throwing in Chinese. They're looking at me puzzled. I'm throwing in Chinese words. <laughs> Okay, but anyway, the, the Chinese text is exactly the same. It says, how is there for a monk fear due to non-clinging? But I still think what happened is that in a very early period, there was a either a reciter's error or a copyist error before the two schools went their separate way, the <coughs> Pali school, and then I think the Chinese version is based on the Sarvastivada school. So before those two schools went their separate way, this, I would call it a textual error, has entered into the text. Because it makes much better sense to take it according to the usual meaning through non-clinging, there is no agitation. Through clinging, there's agitation. Through non-clinging, there is no agitation. Okay, let's see the explanation. This is paragraph 21. Okay, so here, the well-taught noble disciple who has regard for the noble ones and, someone, and so on, does not regard material form as self, for self is possessed of material form and so on. So you see, not regarding material form as self, and that supports my interpretation, not regarding material form as self is non-clinging. Regarding material form, the five aggregates as self, is clinging. So not regarding form and the other aggregates as self is non-clinging. Okay, so then that material form of his changes and becomes otherwise. With the change and becoming otherwise of material form, his consciousness is not preoccupied with the change of material form. Again, this is what happens when one doesn't identify the body as self, so the body changes. It doesn't mean one has to be a noble person, a stream enterer, but even somebody who has this right view of the body, the body gets sick, changes, grows old, and one doesn't become preoccupied with that. Looking in the mirror every day, are there more gray hairs, more wrinkles, 
I remember back, well, still I see that, but this used to occur to me many years ago sometimes. Maybe it occurred one time when I was riding on the subway. Like a woman came onto the train, sat opposite me, and she could have been 75 years old, but the hair was dyed like a bright red, and the face was painted over with so much makeup and lipstick, like she was trying to look like she's 25 or 30 years old. And I felt so sorry for her. And I think this was even before I encountered Buddhism. <laughs> but it just stuck in my mind that how a person is so attached to their physical appearance that they you know, try to disguise the fact of aging. Okay, so the consciousness is not preoccupied with the change of form. Then agitated mental states born of preoccupation with the change of form do not arise together and obsess his mind. And so with this, because the mind is not obsessed, he's not anxious, distressed, and concerned, no anxiety spells, no panic attacks, no fainting and de deep distress because of the change, but one can accept the change with equanimity. Okay, so then Maha Kachana goes through the whole, the same pattern with regard to the other four aggregates. And then he sort of comes to the conclusion, paragraph 22. So when the Buddha rose from his seat and went into his dwelling, after giving a summary without expounding the detailed meaning, then he repeats the summary statement. And then he says, I understand the detailed meaning of the summary to be thus. But now he's going to give the monk's liberty to sort of double check on him. So he says, if you want, go to the Blessed One and ask him about the meaning of this. And as the Blessed One exp explains it to you, so you should remember it. Okay, so the monks get up and they go to the Buddha and then they repeat to the Buddha Mahakachana's explanation. Then the Buddha ends with a word, a statement of praise of Mahakachana. Mahakachana, O monks, is wise. He has great wisdom. <laughs> if you had asked me the meaning of this, if I hadn't gone to my dwelling and closed the door behind me, I would have explained it to you in the same way that Mahakachana has explained it. So that is the meaning, and so you should remember it. And that is the end of the sutta. Okay, if there are a few questions, we could take them now. If there are questions that need fuller discussion, then save them for after. What, what troubles me is that if the Buddha has the divine eye, <clears throat> wouldn't he know that they don't know that? What would he leave it there without a summary? And then later on explain, well, you could have asked me, wouldn't he have he known this already? That they, what I'm trying to say is if he spoke to the disciples and he explained only the exp the summary, not the exposition, yeah. wouldn't he at the end know this already? What would he ask them? Well, you could have asked me. I would have tell you the same way, but you should have asked me. Well, would he just have not explained it in the beginning? Like you explained before in, in, in the suttas, is explained that he goes through it, or the yeah. Chinese Sutta, he explains the exposition and summary. Yeah, yeah. So wouldn't it be more correct to say that he goes, starts the Sutta, and explains it without having to stop at the, uh, exp I mean, at the summary? Is your point that with when, the divine eye, the, the Buddha would have known that the disciples didn't understand? Correct. And so he should have stayed and given the explanation? Correct. I just don't know the answer. <laughs> okay. It seems that he, sh 
since he announced that I'm going to give a summary and exposition, he should have given the exposition, but why he went, he departed without giving the exposition, it's a puzzle. Right. One could say that he could have foreseen that the monks would go to Mahakachana and ask him, and Mahakachana would give a good explanation. But in that case, he should have just not said, I'll teach you a summary and an exposition, but he should have just stated the summary, summary without offering to give the exposition and then left. Or he could have given just a short statement and said, if you want to know the detailed meaning, go ask Mahakachana. Correct, yeah. It's, so it's a puzzle. I don't know the answer. Yeah, I know. Thanks. Excuse me? Somebody here had the question. Okay, then we'll end now and we'll come back at 12.15 and we could have some discussion. Oh, and before we end, <laughs> next week we won't be having a class because we have the Abhidharma retreat I'm not sure whether there are any openings left. Earlier this week, Ji Shu told me that six people had registered for the Abhidharma retreat. <laughs> and I thought, how is that possible? I thought, maybe I'll just cancel it <laughs> if they're just six. But then, Sam had checked with Kaidi, and Kaidi said, oh, almost 70 people have registered. And then Ji Shu told me later, she said 60. She had said 60, but I heard six. Okay, so next week there's the Abhidharma retreat. If you're interested to attend, you can inquire whether there are still any openings. Better rush. <laughs> and then the next class will be the... Saturday after that, when we'll do Sutta number 139. Oh, wait! Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's the 5th, the 12th, the 19th will be the next class. No. The 12th, I won't be here, yeah. Okay, so we now end with sharing the merits. Sharing the merits to the deities, Dharma protecting devas, the nagas or dragon spirits, the Buddhas, the fear spirits, and all beings. Akasata chabhumata deva naga mahidika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu sasanam akasata jabhumata deva naga mahidika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu desanam akasata jabhumata deva naga mahidika punyantang anumoditva Chirang rakantu mang parang eta vatacham hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe devanu modantu sabha sampati sedia eta vatacham hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe bhutanu modantu sabha sampati sedia Eta vatacham hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe satanu modantu sabha sampati siddhya pavagupadaya vichyeta to etantare satakayupapana rupia rupicha sanya sanino dukha pamuchantu pusantu nibhuting
Okay, we'll end with three half bows to the Buddha. It's good to arrange. Yeah, it's not on. Yeah, I have I noticed that on the uh, the Buddha speaks of uh, to the noble ones, and he speaks about the jhanas, and he explains to them about the jhanas. Or oh, not the Buddha, I meant to say uh, the the monk, of course. But then he goes into the uh, twenty one. Or 20, and then he's actually, I don't know if I'm right, but he, he's going not, he's talking to a, uh, a lay person because he states here that I hear an unthought or yeah. uh, an ordinary person who yeah. has no regard for novel ones yeah. and is on scale. So I noticed that they're changing the uh, perspective of, of discipline. In other words, he's talking about the noble ones, and the other side he's talking to a lay person. Is that right? Well, this is just, it's setting up a contrast between, it's not, this isn't the contrast between the lay person and a monk. You know, it's not in terms of their ordination status or lack of ordination, but this is the contrast is between what is called the putujana, which is the ordinary common person of the world, and the Arya Savaka, who is a noble disciple, or a disciple of the noble ones. So this is the contrast between one who just follows the way of the world and has you know, the view of self and then identifies the five aggregates as a self, and one who has learned the Dhamma of the noble ones and therefore doesn't identify any of the five aggregates as self. Yeah. You know, so the contrast here isn't between would be a gahapati a, or a gihi, a layperson, and a bishu, a monk. Right. But rather the contrast is between putujana and arya savaka. But you know what? What is interesting is that he goes into an advanced stage of teaching. Is more or less a person has already gone into second, third, fourth jhanas. Then he goes right back down into a layperson and explains a person that is, uh, you know, that is, is ordinary in thought. I see. Uh, yeah. The contrast is, I mean, to the different, you know, personalities, I mean, or, or lay person and, and the, uh, the monk, or the, or the noble ones. It's, it's, it's got yeah, that's be, because the contrast here is revolving around whether they, you see, when he's speaking about the monk, then he's speaking about the attainment of the various stages, meditative stages, right. the jhanas. Okay, and so that is considered like the special domain of the of the monk. But now, in this pa the passage on Sakaya on personality view, on identity view, the contrast it doesn't involve whether a person is a monk or not a monk, but whether the person is a worldling, an ordinary person who's, who's not instructed in the Dhamma. And that is the person who identifies five aggregates as self, and a person, whether monk or lay person, who's instructed in the Dhamma and doesn't identify as self. Yeah, but the clingings are different, of course, because the clinging on the, uh, on, on the noble ones is the first jhana, the second jhana. It's, it's actually, you could be uh, uh, attached to rapture, where it's actually an attainment, you know, it's actually a very advanced age, where on the other side, uh, with the uh, lay person, He's, he goes way back into the attachments of worldly, you know, sensual pleasures. So it's a, it's a big contrast there of sensual desires. You know, one is actually from the attainment, from the second and third. And of course, the fourth, you have equanimity, where you let go of, of sensual pleasures. You don't, you're not attached, you're not clinging to that. 
third or second or first. Wait, the, the jhanas are not explained in terms of the noble person. You said the jhanas are explained in terms of the noble one. Not that it is, but I mean, I would speculate that it would be a noble person if he's already no, at not that stage. No, he's just speaking in terms of the bhikkhu. And also remember that these are stock, we call them stock formulas. So whenever the formula for the four jhanas are given, the stock formula, almost always it has the bhikkhu as the practitioner. When the contrast between uh, set up around sakaya ditti, the view of self, the contrast is always that between the ordinary person and the noble disciple. That makes sense. Yep. Thanks. Okay, some uh, ter terry. Bhante, <coughs> you were, in your talk you mentioned about through non clinging. You have agitations, yep. and I understand it in another way. It would be like there are times when beings are accustomed to holding on to yeah. uh, sense fears. Yeah. When these sense fears are absent, yeah. then you get agitated. <laughs> That's a good explanation. <laughs> Except I still think that the text has come down with <laughs> wrongly transcribed because, <clears throat> okay, if through non clinging there is agitation, if that was the correct original reading, one would expect some explanation to show how this could be the case since it's such a departure from the usual formula. And yet the explanation is the same as the regular formula that we come to when the Buddha is explaining how through non-clinging there is no agitation. So it seems to me that, again, <laughs> I don't want to be like insistent on it, but I'm pretty sure that there's just been a transcription error that has gotten into the record. And I just want to add a little bit more. Yeah. <clears throat> I come from a tradition of Tibetans and from the Himalayan region. So there there is a practice in the evenings when they kind of make offerings to those beings who have no body. Yeah. So these beings, so-called beings with no body, are looking for some form of body and they yeah. cannot find a body. So they are undergoing through a lot of uh, suffering. Yeah. And that's because they haven't found a body. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, this is just my. I see. Thought. So they are having, call this agitation or distress because they're looking for something to cling to? Yes. They're, they're lacking bodies. So, yeah. as they had a body before, are accustomed to having some form of mm. body to cling to. Yeah. So they are in a great form of agitation. Yeah. Yeah. And then the practice is just, yeah. of course, metta, I think, is there. Yeah. I mean, it's a good way to explain the phrase, through non-clinging there is agitation. And that, of course, with what the commentary says, that there's nothing that can be clung to. <laughs> but I, it just seems to me, because the explanation that comes actually illustrates the case where somebody doesn't have clinging because he doesn't identify with self, and so he doesn't have agitation. Yes, I think. Did Chris? Did you have your hand? Bo oh, okay, Bowe had her hand. Okay, my comment was just that. <clears throat> uh, I, I think what he was describing is clinging. You know, wanting to have a, a body. You know, not yeah. having a body and wanting to have it. Thinking about having a body, seeking to have a body. You know, th this is clinging. I mean. Um, yeah, one could also say that that is a kind of yeah. clinging. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> even though they have the clinging, but <clears throat> and as I said, this his explanation agrees with what, a bit with what the commentary says. They have clinging, and they're searching for something, but they can't find anything to cling to, <laughs> and so that causes the agitation. Okay, first we take Paul away, then. Richard, and then Stacy, Stacy, and then Caroline. I think my question is pretty simple. 
can that negation, because in Chinese we can put that bu to negate the, the following four words. So one does not, and bracket is upadana. Yeah. And, um, You're asking whether this would work in Pali? Yeah. The original can that negation to negate both. To, to cling. No, because in Pali we have anupada paritasana, so it's not using the negative particle n, but it's using the negative prefix an. Yeah, but I remember another passage in the Sapa Sapa Sutta Banana, mm. and that you said because that uh, villagers, the villager is supposed to hand the handing a gift to the king. Mm. And that's the similar structure, right? Mm. I asked Bender several times. And that negation is also from, it's not from N-A, na. It's I from, right, yeah. Yeah, so that negate both. Yeah. No, I no. don't think so. Okay. <coughs> of course, in here we have the contrast is clearly between upada paritasana, through clinging there is agitation, and anupada paritasana, through non-clinging there is agitation. Thank you. Since I have the microphone, can I have another question? <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, what makes Bhante think that the shifting in word from uh, vinya consciousness to citta is insignificant? It's because Bhante wants to avoid dispute. <laughs> <laughs> No, or is is a really funny? Really thinks believes it this way. It's insignificant. Is because I think this sutta is quite a bit a bit dynamic. Yeah, it's, you can see the transitional uh, features there. Yeah, and in the Abhidhamma we uh, emphasize more on the citta, right? Yeah, and in uh, suttas is it, it is consciousness, and usually Bani say okay in in the suttas, consciousness is synonymous with uh, citta. But then when it comes to the Abhidhamma, they are two different. No. Um, yeah, uh, because citta is the, the chocolate box. <laughs> <laughs> and they are, H, they are so, uh, uh, you have to put, I think maybe mental consciousness is one of the chocolates. So there is a, you can see they are, <laughs> different. They definitely not, they are not identical. So no, I think in this okay. sutta, the two are being leave out of the discussion, the Abhidhamma versus sutta. It's just that you could see that the text uses sometimes vinyana, then it shifts to citta, and apparently there's no difference in meaning. It's really insig insignificant. It even, really, it's insignificant, yeah. Even we call this textbook as highly, uh, highly rigged recension highly re what's the word highly recension text no no re recension recension yeah uh, highly like under critical revision what's the word for it recension no recension ah. yeah so in what sense it's highly recension um that's the word in Bhante's introduction, I remember. A word say... Uh, Recension usually means like a version of a text. Yeah, but it's under critical um, revision. Yeah. Or a certain crucial point to, to accommodate the tenets of their schools. Yeah, but this is not, I don't, I don't think this has undergone revision to accommodate the, the tenets of the Theravada school in any way. I think this, as I said, it's just that the text flux, fluctuate, uh, changes in the use of the word, vinyana, chitta, without, as I said, that there's no, oh, maybe this is the point, actually. I think, now I think there is a point. Okay, now I think I see the reason. 
because it's speaking in terms of the six sense objects. You see, so when vinyana is used in the suttas, it's usually the six kinds of vinyana in relation to the six faculties, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose, tongue, body, mind consciousness. So when describing the six spheres of sensory experience, vinyana is used. And so this is the case where the text is speaking about seeing a form with the eye, hearing a sound with the ear, and so on. So it's describing sensory, it's describing the experience in terms of the six sense domains. So in that case, vinyana is the appropriate word to use. But then when we come to the next section on the jhanas, then for jhana, then citta is more appropriate because we're not dividing the experience up in terms of the sense domains. Got it? So that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Um is isn't there a a point in the in in insight when you when you first let go of the clinging? where you sort of become fearful or horrified of all your past clinging and, and could it be could it relate to that I don't you mean this passage through non-clinging there is agitation yeah. I again I have to be a bit stubborn and insistent If it were relating to something else, if the if that expression were genuine, authentic, ancient, the original part of the original discourse, then the explanation that follows would explain the meaning. But as I said, the explanation that follows makes sense if we take through non-clinging, there is no agitation not through non-clinging, there is agitation. Or through clinging, there is... Now I'm getting mixed up. Yeah. Yeah, the explanation makes sense if we understand the original expression to be saying, through non-clinging there is no agitation, it doesn't make sense if we take the original expression to be, through non-clinging there is agitation. Oh, who is to take, Mike, Richard, okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask Tsering if, uh, if the creatures were were hungry ghosts because this spiritual creatures and and ghosts and such you know in, in in popular lore tend to have a national flavor a bunch of ingredients get in there that aren't purely theological and so i was wondering what the character of these as the the frustrated creatures who were attached to their forms and couldn't find their, you know, didn't have their bodies, and so were and were grieved because of that. I was, I was wondering because, for instance, there are creatures in in Japanese legend, right, that have little hollows on the tops of their heads where they have oil, and they can't tilt their heads different ways because they'll, if they lose their oil, they die, and so they always have to, you know, and they're and the, and the hungry ghosts have very small necks so that they can't swallow anything mm. and such and so i was just wondering what i wanted to know more about these creatures if they were if they were hungry ghosts tearing yeah yeah he's asking tearing not me yeah right tearing are, are they are they hungry ghosts 
What kind of to- can you say more about these creatures? What are they like? Okay, <coughs> you're wrong, and then Carolyn. Andy, my question is about nimita, yeah. especially about dhamma nimita. Yeah. Well, we often say the three characteristics of dhamma would be impermanence, yeah. non-self, and uh, suffering, dukkha. Yeah. Um, are they nimita? That's the first part of the question. No, that's a different word, actually. That word, I think it gets translated into Chinese by the same character, xiang. But it, or xiang, but it's, um, in Pali, there are different words. There's, this is here, nimitta, and the three, what are called the three dharma seals, would be, in Pali, lakana. Okay. Yeah. Now, terms aside, I'm not, Sticker for terms, yeah. But say if if a uh, if a meditator yeah. um, was clinging to the signs of a particular level of jhana, yeah, and then realized that that particular uh, sign is impermanent, is non-self, is dukkha, therefore is able to move on. But isn't that a distraction? By itself, because you're supposed to focus on something, and then your mind starts to wonder, "Wow, this is actually non-self. This is impermanent." Hmm. So, in a way, the concept or the ideas of non-self and impermanent is a object of the mind base. The mind yeah. grasps on a dhamma. So, <clears throat> if if whether you call it uh, lakanas or nimita, when we realize that a particular mm. particular sign we're we're investigating mm. is yeah. non-self, is impermanent, yeah. then in a way my mind has drifted away from my original focus of attention yeah. in order to reach that. Yeah. And then once I do uh, that, and if I if I just finish this, if I persist on if I if I persist on thinking everything is non-self is is impermanent, yeah. then isn't that itself a clinging also? Isn't that itself a clinging, an attachment? Yeah. Actually, there are several questions here. I mean, within that. Okay, if one is practicing samadhi meditation with the aim of reaching the jhana, or if one is in the jhana and sort of lightly comes out and then starts thinking this is impermanent, but one's obje- objective is to focus and strengthen the jhana, then that's a distraction when we just realize I'm not practicing now in order to do insight or vipassana. My purpose is to ach- either achieve or to strengthen the samadhi, the jhana. So then one would just, if thoughts relating to insight arise, one would just put them aside and go back and to strengthen the concentration. Because that is one's immediate purpose. Okay, so that is, I think, the first question that you asked. The second, if you become sort of delighted with the insight into impermanence, isn't that a kind of attachment? Was that the question? Yeah. Uh, wait, I, wait, now you're piling on question after question, so I have to take them one at a time. Okay, if you're, you said, if I'm completely dedicated to concentration, how can I ever reach insight? No, there'll come a time when one has the concentration sufficiently stabilized, then one would realize that this is not sufficient, then I want to do insight, and then one will develop insight. 
the fact that one is devoting some time to developing concentration doesn't mean that one never gets to insight. Well, one has to make the effort. It doesn't, it's not that the insight arises by itself, but just for different people it will be at different stages, depending on a lot of circumstances. Let's say somebody obtains, say, the first jhana, stabilizes it, makes it, it well, well consolidated, then they'll think, okay, now I want to develop insight on this, and then they'll use that as a basis for developing insight. Others might go on not stopping with the first jhana, but going on second, third, fourth jhana, then after stabilizing the fourth jhana, developing insight. Yeah. 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 Clinging to belief. Well, of course, if one can create time to actually do the, <laughs> the practice, then it's much better. Um, but suppose that there's just so many demands on one's time. I wouldn't consider having the understanding of impermanence, dukkha, non-self, inherent, I wouldn't understand that to be intrinsically an object of clinging or an attachment. Sometimes people, I mean, I've seen this with Buddhists in Sri Lanka, because they sometimes adopt the tenets of Buddhism a little bit dogmatically, then it becomes an object of attachment, particularly when they're getting in conflicts with followers of other religions, or you believe in the soul, but the Buddha teaches non-self. You know, so he comes, there's no soul, just a, just a delusion. So that's in a way taking it as an object of attachment. But if one uses it, you know, you could use impermanent suffering non-self, even, even if one is not develop developing it to the level of meditative insight, but you could still apply it to situations in everyday life, like a close relative dies. Of course, one might go through a certain period of mourning, but other people without the idea of impermanence just become, why did he have to die? He should have been around forever. Oh, I just can't get over his loss. Oh, it's so miserable. But if you have the insight or the understanding of impermanence, you think, this is the nature of things. Whatever arises, passing, passes. And so he came, he lived, he's gone. That's the nature of things. And similarly with, say, the idea of self. You know, some people who have implicit idea of self, oh, I want to become the boss, I want to become the chairman, I want to become the famous, I want to become popular. All of this is rooted from in some kind of subtle attachment to self. And then they become very competitive, manipulative, ambitious, ambitious to fulfill that craving for the, for, for the glorification of the self. But when we have the idea or in some understanding of anatta, even if it's not the deep meditative, then we realize this is not mine, not I, not myself. So why try to glorify it? Why try to, you know, what's the point of all of this competitiveness and ambition and self-glorification. <laughs> so you could use this in day-to-day -day life. Okay, I think Carolyn had a question. You have the microphone already. Is it on? Yes, yeah, on. Yeah. It's not exactly a question. It was an observation. Oh, I, good. Yeah. I had when I read this last night and. Yeah. Uh, it got even stronger when we read it again today. You cannot. Pardon me? You said so. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, it seems so similar to me to the Prajnaparamita Heart Sutra when I read it last night 
And even now when we did this in class, it seemed even more similarities. Really? Yeah. Just the way even like form is emptiness, emptiness is form, form is not other than emptiness, the way it's stated, you know, it's stated in different wording, but the same thing. And even with the Heart Sutra, <laughs> it's Shariputra and Avalokita, and the Buddha is removed, not yeah, present. He, he as gave this. a... Yeah. Even the... I think in the longer version of this Heart Sutra that's come down in the Tibetan tradition, I think the, it does open with the Buddha giving an Udesa, right. and right. then... And then he steps out, and then at the after the whole thing's over, yeah. the Buddha nods that, yes, it's correct. You yeah. know, uh, Avalokita correctly yeah. Yeah. expounded. And even the name of it, the exposition of a summary or the analysis, to me, it, that says hmm. the, the same type of thing. That's just what arose. I think Bowie wanted to say something. It's true because the word for fear that Bhante translated oh, as agitation right. is actually the actually, will kongbu. Actually, that that's is right. The, yeah. the phrase in the heart yeah. sutra. I mean, the, the word Bhante translated yeah, as it's kongbu. Uh, to, to uh, agitation or is the xin wu guai will kongbu. Xin wu guai wu guai wu wu you. Agitation. <laughs> but of course, Kongbu is used to render a variety of Pali or a, a Sanskrit word, so we don't know what the original of Sanskrit word, what the original Sanskrit word is that was rendered Kongbu, but it could have been Paritrishena in Sanskrit. Um, okay. Monte, um, the text was changed, you said, but if it would remain in its original agitation due to non-clinging, yeah. wouldn't that be kind of like non-clinging based on wrong view, so it would create agitation? And um, it's Non-clinging kind of, based on wrong view? Uh, agitation based on non-clinging, yeah. uh, but it's non-clinging uh, rooted in wrong view. It's the same like last week when uh, the Buddha said about equanimity and uh, <laughs> going. Um, and he's like, those fools, or I can't even remember the words he used, but some of the people, the householder, their view of equanimity is not the correct equanimity yeah. as opposed to yeah the bhikkhus. No. Uh, so wouldn't, I'm not sure uh, why the change was necessary because agitation due or, or due to uh, not playing, it kind of makes sense. Maybe to you it does, to me it doesn't. <laughs> I don't know. No, I, I mean, uh, after, the, after reading it a few times, I, I I, and reading the notes, it just, it, you can get agitation from non-clinging if it's non-clinging rooted in wrong view. Mm, but we don't see in the suttas, to my knowledge, any place Not where the Buddha speaks else. about non-clinging right. coming from wrong view. Wrong view is always taken to be a form of clinging. Does that go back to, I think, in the Heart Sutra it says, or something to all view is wrong view, or...? I don't think the Heart Sutra says that. This seems to be like a popular saying that I've heard coming from Zen circles, one that I disagree with also. And also in the jhanas, um, to get to the um, succeeding jhanas, you have its natural upon reflection, you have to abandon uh, yeah. or, or in the first jhana yeah. and what you've gained from so, it, or else you'll never get to. So yeah. when uh, the Buddha was talking about that, isn't that kind of a natural progression that we abandon? We take what we gained yeah. from the first jhana and before we can even get to the second jhana? In other words, if you're stuck and you're attached to that um, yeah. 
you'll never get to the second jhana. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. And well, uh, maybe not. Maybe you could still be attached to the first, have some kind of attachment to the enjoyment of the first jhana. But then, if one hears that the pleasure in the second jhana is superior, then well, of, yeah, then one will be. But some of the states that arise or, or are present in the first jhana are not uh, there in the second jhana, like joy. Yeah. Uh, so if you're attached to that, you'll never attain the second jhana or the third and so forth. Mm -hmm. Let's say one can be enjoying that joy in the first jhana, but still have an upon hearing that the joy in the second jhana is superior, still make an aspiration and attain it, and then one has attachment to both kinds, of, <laughs> to both jhanas. But there is no joy in the second No, there is. Or is it the third jhana? Well, the third, the third is... jhana, the equanimity, right. Yeah. So, and also, uh, lastly, Ma, they, the Buddha uh, gives the summary and then the monks are like, what should we do? So you're like, oh, let's go to Mahakachana. Yeah. And then so they go, and he gives this long explanation, and they're like, oh, that was great, that was great. Let's go ask the Buddha. <laughs> yeah, if they could have just either gotten the Buddha before he went into his room or waited a little while. I think that's conspiracy. When Buddha is gone, you know where to, who, whom to ask. Anyway, don't forget that this is in a way that a little bit setting up a dramatic scene. There's sort of probably like blocks of text that have come come down in oral tradition. Then one has to compose a background scene to explain how that exposition took place. And so this is the way it was done. Okay, unless somebody has a really pressing question, then we'll close for the day. You had a question. Uh, Bhante, uh, it's, yeah. I, first of all, I, I'm buying your your opinion that is uh, missing in transcription. But should when you translate, you add the word, should you put a square bracket to the to the non n o n? Good, good, good editorial suggestion. Yes, it should have been done. Yeah, very good suggestion. No, 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 no. But it's a correct suggestion. Excuse me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you guys want to discuss anything further, I will invite uh, Mahakachana to come. Okay, so we'll do three bows to the Buddha. <laughs>